All right, we're Golden Doves class, uh, what is it, 231, I think. Yeah, Golden Doves class 231, page 139, really fascinating uh, topic about cosmology. The two books, the, uh, the actual Torah and the, um, and the universe. Okay, and the idea of oraita, oraita being a sense of artistic order, right? So the Torah represents an artistic order without which there would be chaos. So um, we start with tohu babohu, which is chaotic, but God turns the chaos into order. Okay, let's continue. Again, page 139. Since the Torah and the universe manifest the tension, which is resolved in endless, endless variations, the order of Oraita cannot be conceived of in static terms, right? We're not talking about a static order. So we have to see a beautiful Michelangelo um, sculpture. And it's well balanced and it's uh, appealing and everything is just done in a magnificent manner, but it's completely static. But there is order. That order is a static order. I believe that the order, and I think this is what my father meant, that the order of the cosmos is seen successively. It's when you see the development in, in accordance with the time axis and the progress and the motion, and then you connect the dots and then you see the order. That's the order that we're talking about. And similarly with the Torah, you have to connect the letters Am I connecting the letters? I mean, you can have just random letters, so it looks like random letters. But you need to connect the letters, and then you see the order, right? Okay, uh, so again, the order of oraita cannot con be conceived of in static terms as, is, as in Indo-European thought. For the Hebrew, the order is providence. Ah, you see? So... When you connect the dots and you see, oh, Ashka you see, um, let's say for those of you who believe in the theory of evolution, which I consider to be from just from a purely scientific perspective, ludicrous and preposterous. I don't want to use any other uh, adjectives, but I'm thinking of some. Um, but anyway, let's even say you 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 you, you say that I don't know the. Uh, clot of mud turns into a beautiful flower. Well, that clot of mud turning into a beautiful flower in the Jewish mind, you see the providence of God because a clot of mud could have stayed a clot of mud, right? <laughs> but the fact that it turned into a beautiful flower itself is providence. an exquisite system of relations establishing a dynamic balance between things. And that's a remarkable thing about the ecology of the world is that there is this dynamic balance between different things in the world. And this dynamic balance allows the world to continue running in such a perfect way. So there are cycles in the world. Sometimes it turns warm or sometimes it becomes colder. I'm talking about natural cycles. Um, and um, there's different variations there's different components to these cycles. There's different variables. And it may look chaotic, but at the end, uh, at the end, with all what appears to be chaotic, you know, the alignment of the planets in the solar system, causing gravity on the um, crust of the Earth, causing perhaps in one case or in one era, the crust to expand and to crack, releasing molten into the oceans, lava, into the ocean, magma, not molten, molten lava or, or uh, uh, magma into the oceans, um, resulting in an increase in the ocean temperature, resulting in excess water vapor in the atmosphere, resulting in um, certain global warming, especially at the poles less at the equator. So, which by the way is what we're seeing today. Um, so uh, this is a natural cycle. And, but, 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 you know, people say, oh my gosh, the world is going to end. 
because of this natural cycle, but no, because somehow then eventually the alignment of the planets shifts and the gravitational force on the crust subsides and the crust, so to speak, closes in on itself and the water temperatures eventually stabilize. And then there might be another cycle leading perhaps to an ice age or to a mini ice age. Um, so you see, according to the succession, you see like, you see a succession of seasons, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter, not just in the, in the annual sense that we see it, but you see the succession over time, over decades, over centuries, over millennia, right? Things happening. And then these cycles produce the diversity of life and the beauty of life on the planet. Sorry for that tangent. I just had to... Uh... Um, so that's the exquisite system of relations establishing a dynamic balance between things. This means, first of all, that nature is purely structural. Right, interesting. It denotes a system of relations and balances rather than content or things, right? Because for the pagan mind, there's mother nature, right? The mother nature somehow exists out there. And for us, there is no mother nature. There's no content in nature, whether there's structures and the relationships between different structures. It denotes a system of relations and balances rather than content or things in an ontic ontological sense, right? Ontic ontological is the way nature would perceive itself or the world would perceive itself ontologically um, had it had a mind, right? David Nieto noted that Teva, the Hebrew term for nature, was first coined in the Middle Ages as a direct influence of Arabic philosophical thought. Nonetheless, a similar term, the nominal form Matbea, is common in rabbinic literature. So Teva just starts in the Middle Ages because the Arabs thought in terms of nature, and we borrowed the idea of nature, and we have the word Teva. But, so that's a relatively late term. But then you have the word matbea. Matbea is a coin. Okay. So nonetheless, a similar term, the nominal form matbea, is common in rabbinic literature. A semantic analysis of this term will contribute to a proper understanding of the Hebrew concept of nature and show how matbea involves structural systems and relations rather than things in content or content. It's very interesting. So we do have the word matbea. We don't have the word teva originally. Right? So we don't have, I mean, earlier, we don't have the word uh, teva. But we have matbea. Matbea has to do with structure. Right? This term first means first coinage, right? Especially the standard denomination against which other coins fluctuate. So you have like the matbea hamedina, let's say in America, it's the U.S. dollar. And then we say, oh, the euro is up or down relative to the dollar, right? Um, right? Or the pound is up or down relative to the dollar. So the matbea is the dollar. This standard is a criterion whereby other coins and currencies are measured. Its own value, however, is purely semiological, not material. The value of the matbea, let's say in the case of the U.S. dollar, there's nothing, it's paper, right? There's nothing intrinsically valuable in the paper. It's actually, the U.S. dollar is a good example, right? It's a semiological, it's a semiological, it's a sign to something. Uh, it's a sign that points out to the government, of the United States, which says we will recognize this piece of paper as legal tender, Right? And by the way, if you don't recognize it as legal tender, we will punish you. So let's say the minute somebody says we don't want to recognize the U.S. dollar, let's say uh, Muammar Gaddafi, <laughs> right? If you remember the uh, dictator in Libya, he wanted to get off the U.S. dollar and sell oil in other denominations and not recognize the U.S. dollar. Uh, he was brutally killed by the mob, the CIA. So the point is that the matbea is a semiological, it's a sign, it points out to something, right? 
not material. So that's one thing about the Mukpeh. Um, a second meaning is a liturgical formula established by the rabbis. So the matbeah also means matbeah uh, let's say the structure of the berachot, where the hachamim established certain berachot for certain um, events. Or a liturgical formula does not have to be berachot. The formula concerns a relation between different elements of the liturgy, not the content of specific wording. Right? That's a very interesting way of looking at it. So it represents the um, relationship of things to each other, right? If you change the structure of the baracha, it's, it's, it's invalid. If you add a word here or there, but don't change the structure, maybe the best example is the uh, amida. So the amida, they, they, they gave you the structure of the amida, the 18 barachot, later on 19 barachot. If a person changes the content of a particular baracha, but, but he had the matbeah, meaning he followed the specific order. And he ended the beracha with baruch atashem, honen adat, baruch atashem, aruseh b'tshuva, and so on. He didn't change the structure, but he changed the content. Yes, I did. Yeah. The formula concerns relate. Wait, okay. Thus, if one preserve the structure of the liturgical formula, but change the content or wording, for example, beginning the blessing of the morning Shema with the formula of the evening Shema, or vice versa, one has fulfilled one's duty, yes, the Berachot of Kiryat Shema. That's a better example. So you said the Beracha of uh, Arvit for Shahit or vice versa, um, you fulfill the obligation. Uh, right, you started, meaning, Let's say which is a formula for Arvi. And then you ended, that's a structure established by Hachamim for Shahrid. You didn't end with the structure of Arvi. However, if one preserved the content or changed the structure, for example, Introducing the format of a long blessing to what is prescribed as a short format or vice versa, what is not discharged the obligation. For example, you say, you change the structure. That's a beracha that's not supposed to start with baruch Hashem, right? A third meaning is signet, seal. It derives from taba, sunken, dipped. Interesting, not fair because you, you seal, you put the seal in the uh, whatever the wax or whatever you use for the seal. In allusion to the act of dipping the signet in the process of stamping, this is the principal meaning of matbea. A coin is currency, currency, I'm sorry, by virtue of the stamp it bears. That's a fascinating idea. Therefore, it's valued as semi-logical, not material, meaning even a coin, which you say, oh, it's made out of metal. So it's the metal that has a value. That's not entirely true. It's true that the metal has value. But what gives the coin the specific value, what makes it linger, legal, tender, I'm sorry, and fungible, that's what I'm looking for, is the fact that it has a signet, and therefore you recognize it immediately as legal tender. Um, accordingly, the rabbis designated an unminted coin, Asimon. The renowned theologian Rabbi Binyamin Musapia observed that this term is a loan word, from the Greek, asemion, without a sign, asimon, asemion. Interesting. By analogy, the liturgical formulas established by the rabbis bear the seal of authority and have currency and acceptability. That's an amazing idea, which we have to discuss more, but I thought it would be 